thumb rule that you apply to morbidly obese people or even slightly obese people, what is the th you know what is the formula that you give to your patients when it comes to bariatric surgery? Uh, you know, you know, this confusion over who can have a bariatric surgery and who cannot have a bariatric surgery in case of fat people. You know, the common people only understand fat people; they don't understand morbidly obese and obese. So what is the thumb rule applied? There are scientific guidelines mm -hmm. which are laid down by the International Federation. Mm -hmm. International Federation talks about bariatric surgery to be the ideal treatment mm -hmm. or the scientific, most scientific tool to help obesity and related diseases in patients whose body mass index is more than 40. In case the patient has got any comorbidity like diabetes, hypertension or high cholesterol or kidney disease or heart disease, mm -hmm any major joint problem or the sleep disorder. These patients at the BMI of 35 are eligible to undergo this operation. Are there any difference between Indians and Yes, uh, ethnically, Indians? yes. Okay. Ethnically, Indian population is different from the Caucasian ones. Okay. So typically the South Asians, inclusive of Indians, have got body mass index which is less, but the fat which is more. So we are typically known as thin fat Indians. Sure. So yes. we look thin from outside, yes. but we are fat. So when we are fat, we get all the diseases related to fat well before we become big in terms of obese. So I was fortunately a part of uh, guidelines which were formulated for the Asian population. Mm -hmm. This which we have published in the JAPI in 2008 where the formulated guidelines say that for typically an Indian origin patient, a BMI more than 37.5 is an indication for bariatric surgery and a patient who has got BMI more than 32.5 with diabetes or hypertension or any major risk related to obesity, this patient should undergo bariatric surgery. As per the International Diabetic Federation, mm -hmm. IDF, a patient more than 30 BMI whose diabetes is uncontrolled with normal practice to attend diabetic control is a patient eligible to go for bariatric surgery. Doctor, that's a very interesting point. Uh, most of these patient people with diabetes would obviously have uncontrolled diabetes because, because of the insulin resistance owing to the obesity. This is, True. It's quite obvious that you know obese people might have to take up uh, bariatric surgery as a only option left. Actually, right? Yes. Okay, doctor. Now most of our you know viewers are going to be and readers are also going to be uh, type two diabetic. So before surgery, what is the preparation done? Uh, what are the requirements? You know, what are the uh, prerequisites for bariatric surgery? Whenever any candidate lands up in my clinic, mm -hmm. there is a protocol how to evaluate the patient. Okay. So patient may come with the positive history in hand that I have got diabetes or they may not be knowing it. Okay. So a patient who lands up in the obesity clinic, first we have to evaluate them nutritionally. We have to understand their eating habits, their eating culture. We have to understand the kind of lifestyle, sedentary or active. We have to also understand the demands from life and their expectations from the life. So typically a young man, mm -hmm. maybe at the age of 22, with 140 kgs of weight, has a different kind of expectation from the life and an old man who is 65 with 80 kgs of weight, with a lot of diseases, he's expectation is different. Before you continue doctor, hmm. most of these morbidly obese are always right from the beginning of the, I mean probably from teenage itself, isn't it? Somebody Can somebody become morbidly obese in the, uh, after 50? Yes, Did very you? much yes. It is known. After you leave your activity, it can happen. Second important thing is obesity now we know 
that obesity doesn't lead to diabetes and all those diseases. Obesity, diabetes, BP, all these diseases are a part of one syndrome which is called metabolic syndrome. So unless your metabolism goes bad, you cannot become diabetic. Unless the metabolism goes bad, you cannot become obese. So when we want to treat anybody's obesity, diabetes, all these troubles, we have to treat the metabolism of that person. Mm -hmm. And for that we have to do, as I said in the beginning, nutritional evaluation and the other part is the metabolic evaluation of the person. When we talk about metabolic evaluations, we have to know about the cholesterol and lipid levels. We have to know about the endocrine functions like thyroid. Mm -hmm. We have to know about many metabolic products which come as uric acid. Okay. We have to know about the nutrition. We have to know about the beta cells of the pancreas. How they are responding to the excessive energy. So when we talk about pre-diabetes, we understand that the beta cells are working more struggling hard to get over with this glucose instability. When a patient goes into a diabetic phase, or it means that the beta cells are now getting into a tired mode. And typically when we tell patients that for obesity and diabetes, do not lose even on one day in starting your treatment because every day is a damage. Every fluctuation is a damage. Some people are happy about it that my fasting and PP is normal, madam. Doesn't mean big. Because you are unable, you are not doing the complete evaluation which should be done with a continuous glucose monitoring for the day. So if we really go for it, we will understand the fluctuations. These fluctuations we tend to understand with the glycosylated hemoglobin. And if somebody's glycosylated hemoglobin is going high or if somebody's beta cell mass is showing less function, then that is the person who needs to be attended as an emergency case or as soon as possible so that before the beta cell gets exhausted, mm -hmm. we have to treat the patient. Doctor, two questions are rising out of this. First thing is that uh, when it comes to you know, HbA1, uh, glycosylated hemoglobin, is there any particular number that you look for when it comes to uncontrolled diabetes? Above 8 or about 9 or sometimes even 13, 14? We, I have come to a very terrifying figure at times which was 16.6. Was it? Yeah. I, I could never imagine that this could be a figure of glycosylated hemoglobin any time. That patient must be lucky to be alive. I know. When we admitted that patient and we tried to control, we continuous glucose monitoring, give insulin as per the glucose at that particular point of time, we came to understand that her requirement for the day was 450 units of insulin. So, I mean, you can understand. How much resistance is? Resistance is big. And more than that, because it's a disease where it makes your tissues numb, you really may not understand that things are going bad. Doctor, which means hyperglycemia, hyperinsulinemia, and of course hypertension. Three things can actually come together uh, in most of the obese patients. Yes, yes. So that can be a dangerous combination. That can be a dangerous combination. Because finally, hyperglycemia will make all the environment unstable. Number two is your tissue remains hungry. Mm -hmm. The tissue remains in the starvation mode because it cannot utilize the sugar which is floating outside the tissue. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the third important thing is the hypertension. Because in obesity, with every added 10 kilograms, then your normal weight you are putting a lot of load on your cardiovascular system which your heart has to work against so it gives rise to hypertension doctor uh, you know in most cases of obesity one major issue is that uh, mm -hmm. the systems are already compromised in the obese patients so how does a surgeon like you come to uh, take a call on if the person 
is uh, you know that uh, you know is uh, can undergo the bariatric surgery or not? See, it is like this. Because if, anyway, diabetes is such a thing that you know it's difficult to <clears throat> operate. Uh, actually speaking, I'll put it in other words. If suppose somebody gets a heart attack, mm -hmm. his heart is compromised. That is why he needs a bypass Treatment. surgery maybe. Okay. I cannot imagine that a normal heart person will come for a major operation like bypass surgery. True. So typically science has given some protocols and some guidelines how to optimize these patients. So even though obese patients do carry major risk factors uh -huh. in their body, there is a scientific guideline how to optimize the patient and we need almost 3 to 5 days for optimization of any patient. If there, was, there would be some very major event, then we may need something like 2 weeks to prepare the patient and get him optimized for well, anesthesia and From what you say, it's very quite clear that uh, surgeons like you involved in bariatric surgery have quite a challenge. You have to control hypertension, you have to control glucose levels, you know, so many things yes. which are simply out of control. And on the other side of the, uh, the coin is that uh, uh, most surgeons won't even touch such a patient. I've heard of dentists who say, you won't touch a patient who is, whose sugar is more than 200. Yes, actually it is, it is a point to be noted that in any patient of hypertension and diabetes, okay, a small operation doesn't remain small. A small element doesn't remain small. So somebody's boil can get cured without any notice, but in a diabetic patient, it can create havoc. In Immediate some patients, yes, also. yes. So typically diabetic and hypertensive patients, we need to optimize, but there are standard guidelines. There are physicians in my unit. It, it is an international center of excellence. I do not work alone. I've got a team of psychologists. I've got a team of nutritionists. I've got a team of metabolic physicians, anesthesiologists, clinical associates who work with me. And the team gives them a complete approach. To optimize it, towards the optimization and towards getting them on table so that the fitness is better. Doctor, what are the complications of the surgery? This is another issue which we often get a lot of mails about trying to understand because most of the reports which come in the media are only about complications. They don't talk about the good things that are happening. So very many people are worried about the complications that can come, come about during the surgery. What are those complications? Okay, uh, let me put it this way. Complications can occur at any place, at any hand, in any patient. It is like driving a car on the road. And if you ask me, can accident happen? You don't need to be drunk. Yeah, you don't need to be drunk. So typically, similarly, we have got the, uh, the points, the causes of complications or the prerequisites for the complications you can say mm -hmm. which belong to some part to the patient some part to the patient means patient's body conditions, health yeah. conditions the doctor where the skills and the expertise are important and the rest of the environment in terms of the post-op and pre-operative care so if these three things we get to optimize level mm -hmm. there is hardly any chance that you get complication because this is a planned operation. This operation doesn't go as an emergency operation. But okay, midnight somebody comes to me, I need to rush him to the theater is not the scene. There is a plan. We get adequate time to for optimization them. and there are good guidelines to optimize. If we use good equipment, if our surgeon is skilled with good expertise, if we discuss the whole thing with the family and the patient, give them importance of the optimization period. If my team is geared to take care of them pre-operatively and post-operatively, inclusive of my anesthesiologist, my physician, then touch wood till date, we have not come across any complication. And if at all any complication occurs, then there are guidelines how to pick them up. 
do not wait as i said a small boil can be a big thing in a diabetic patient so in these patients if at all something happens then how to treat it very much in time there are guidelines and if the surgeon is vigilant then we should not have any loss of life okay doctor uh, you know most often it is quoted about the pulmonary embolism which hmm. happens doesn't it happen in almost all surgeries where the position of the patient is uh, you know, top up head up and leg down correct pulmonary embolism can happen in any patients in the patient of metabolic syndrome and in the patient of obesity the chances are multifold okay number 1 number 2 is because typically when we do bariatric surgery i am learned in france so i do it in the french position typically my patient is literally 60 degrees up standing you can say slanted and i am operating so when these positions come there is a chance but how to minimize it we have to evaluate the patient's chance from the beginning okay we have to understand the coagulation profile we have to hydrate the patient very well in the previous few days we have to give anticoagulants perioperatively and when we operate the patient we give something which is known as sequential compression device which will squeeze out the fluid in the muscles and the legs in the vessels towards the heart this minimizes the chances of pulmonary embolism even if some patient has got a history of dvt mm -hmm. deep venous thrombosis and previous life uh, pulmonary embolism events then we keep the patient admitted in house for almost 10 days and totally optimize them towards the anticoagulation okay if Dr. these things are done pulmonary embolisms should not happen doctor anticoagulants uh, probably like heparin and all that would uh, also lead to a counterproductive situation where there could be leakages there could be bleeding those kind of things right so yes. it's basically a kind of uh, balancing act that you need to prepare these anticoagulants like which we use right yes the kind of anticoagulants which we use are low molecular weight heparin okay the normal heparin which is used in the vascular surgery is not used here okay the operations are done with low molecular weight heparin cover okay and once the patient starts walking and drinking liquids then we do not need to continue them so early ambulation adequate hydration and adequate perioperative cover is the key to save your patient from pulmonary embolism